First up today on Ag Etc, Leah Wilkinson talks to us about the new NAFTA agreement and its relation to the feed industry. Then Ohio State University John Foltz talks to us about the risks of avoiding communication in succession planning. KSU's Anita Dill discusses how cover crops can be used to suppress weeds and set a place with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association explains the benefits of feed conversion efficiency. And we'll end with a Packers view on beef grade from Chad Barker, Vice President of Procurement for National Beef. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine. Your stem cells, your health, your life. So some of the things that we anticipate and we know that Congress is going to have to deal with, the big one is going to be the ratification of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. So NAFTA 2.0, um, the renegotiated NAFTA agreement, it's the USMCA is the new acronym. So that was wrapped up in the fall, but the process of now getting ratification through Congress has to begin. But the hope is that there would be the up or down vote in the late spring, early summer on the ratification of this agreement. It's a big priority for agriculture. Um, from the feed industry perspective alone, since NAFTA went into place in 1993, our exports to Mexico and Canada for feed, feed ingredients, and pet food tripled. Um, we're up to $3.1 billion worth of exports to those two countries alone. That's about 30% of our feed um, exports and 50% of our pet food exports go to these two countries alone. So it's a very important market uh, for the animal food industry. There have been some um, discussion and some members of Congress that have said that they do not support the agreement. So there will be a lot of back and forth that will happen um, as the debate goes on. And one of the big issues that remains is the steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, so these are two countries, Canada and Mexico, where we are, um, we hold uh, their steel and aluminum to the tariffs, and that has caused a lot of our agriculture products that go to those countries to have retaliatory tariffs put on them. And so there will be a lot of discussion about uh, the impact of those tariffs and the rescinding of those tariffs to see if we, since we negotiated in good faith with these two countries on um, redoing NAFTA, can we get back to um, the good trade environment that we've had? So expect when you hear NAFTA, you're gonna hear, or USMCA, you're gonna hear probably at least in the first little bit here some discussion about those steel and aluminum tariffs that go hand in hand um, with Canada and Mexico. With NAFTA, we had, from a feed industry perspective, we had zero tariffs. Uh, that remains in the renegotiated agreement. And then another part that is in here that was a win for our industry is the sanitary and phytosanitary chapter. So all of those issues dealing with feed safety, um, animal diseases, how do you deal with uh, trade between our countries, that's in there at what was negotiated during the Trans-Pacific Partnership, if you remember that, um, when the U.S. was a party to that agreement and the negotiations that were there, and then our um, U.S. government has pulled out of that, but it's to that level, which was something that agriculture wanted because that was um, a good thing for agriculture. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. 
We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yeah, we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'll be glad to answer and work with you. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. This segment brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. Sometimes if it's a business where you've got somebody that has been involved in the business and they were the founder, maybe you think that they're just too fragile to discuss with them and not telling them about what you want to do in the future is best for them. Or you think that communicating will make things worse. Your thought might be it's better to, to fear conflict than experience it. Uh, you think that your feelings uh, about something will pass, this too will pass, but usually the opposite happens. Uh, if it just builds, then it, it usually blows up. Uh, and communication is something that we've talked about a lot in our manager's notebook columns. You, in my opinion, you cannot over-communicate. And many of us avoid those sort of topics, particularly these sort of things. But in my opinion, <coughs> if you're running a, a business and looking forward to the future, it's better to tackle it up front rather than to sweep it under the rug. Uh, and then... Finally, you, you think that some of those people that you're working with should obviously understand your actions, but we kind of forget that um, others weren't brought up with our experiences or relations or our communication styles. And so, again, back to that communication piece, and you maybe think that they know what you know or what should happen is straightforward and obvious, but that's not a, a good argument as well because everybody looks at things differently than you do. So, so none of these thoughts, the point I would make is none of them are legitimate for avoiding the topic of succession planning in a business and that it should be tackled head on and it should be a strategic part of your plan for the business of how we're going to move it forward in the, in the future. Because of the th that third comment that I made up there, everybody's mortal and we're all going to leave at some point one way or the other. So a big part of succession planning is managing uh, relationship risks. And so we outline, and what I'm sharing with you here, is you need to look at who are the, the key stakeholders, and you need to look at their roles and their values, the power that they have, and the concerns that they have. And so it deals with people. And I'll, um, when I get into the discussion of what to do when you're the new boss, one of the things that you find is that my comment to the people that I work with at the university is everything revolves around people, politics, and money. Those are the three things that kind of run everything. And it's hard to figure those, those out. Usually there's not enough money, there's too much politics, and, and people are what are involved with all of it. So if you, if you look at that, and I'll mentioned here one of the things that I think it's important to look at is kind of an organizational structure but there's the formal organization there's also the informal organization you know who the influencers are in your business maybe one of your truck drivers maybe they've been there for a long time and people look up to them because of seniority that's kind of the informal side of things but then there's the formal org chart as well and so you have to look at values and the power structure and how you put that all together. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways, of course, 550 on the AM dial, 
streaming at KFRM.com or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. I'm Anita Dilley, and I had the opportunity to share information on how cover crops can be incorporated into an integrated weed management plan. And the three main takeaways that I shared with the group is knowing what weed species um, is the driver for your weed management decisions, and then knowing when those weeds emerge um, in the field so that you can make good decisions about what cover crop species you should select to plant and when, whether it's a fall or a spring seeded. And then really thinking of your crop rotation sequence and how to fit that into that sequence. A lot of times there's a, a big concern of should I plant a cover crop or not because it either can conserve water or potentially use up a lot of water. So growers are worried in our uh, very diverse Kansas environment um, if they will have enough moisture for their cash crop and should they plant a cover crop or not. And so then we are interested in exploring how much water does it use and when should I terminate it in order to make sure that there's enough water for the subsequent cash crop. I've been able to talk about cover crops for a few years now and the general idea of using them for weed suppression, but now farmers are really getting to the point of fine tuning their system and so those are research questions that I'm then exploring. So we've got a lot of one year um, examples of research work that we've done um, looking at, for example, termination timing. When do we terminate our cover crops prior to our cash crop and what's the optimal way of doing that to suppress our weeds in that situation. And so one year study tells us one thing and then we always need another year to, to make sure that it's consistent. A lot of times it is a challenge um, for me to speak because I go across the state of Kansas or around the area to talk about cover crops and I need to be aware of their moisture environment, their crop rotation sequence and where they might fit a cover crop in there. And so it's challenging for me to go to each place to highlight relevant research for them but also then for the grower in that area to really step back and think of their own system. There isn't a cookie cutter recipe that I can give them to say this is how you're going to get weed suppression with a cover crop, but that they have to ask themselves these questions and reflect on what they're doing in their farm to be able to fit cover crops into their system and get the benefits that they want. There's a lot of different questions that growers ask in regards to fitting these cover crops into their system. And things will go from how much residue do I have? Is that persisting long enough to actually suppress the weeds? Are there gonna be impacts of that cover crop on my cash crop and the yield that I wanna produce? And am I gonna get the benefits that I expect to get out of it? So a lot of big picture questions as well as some of the fine tuning questions um, such as what seeding rate should I use? Do I need to add fertilizer to that cover crop to produce the biomass I need for weed suppression? And then of course at the end, how do I terminate it and when? I've had really good luck when I um, do these presentations to meet with farmers and a lot of them are interested in having me come and do little plot studies on their own farm. And so a lot of chances to really try it on their own place and in their own system um, to be able to do that. So the termination timing studies, we've got um, experiments all the way from Colby down to Parsons across the state um, on farmers fields to look at um, how we can uh, fine tune these in their area. So there's opportunities for me to connect with more growers and to um, potentially have experiments on their fields. They can get a hold of me at the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University in Manhattan. Um, uh, on our website, you can find me at uh, D-I-E-L-E-M-A-N at ksu.edu is my email. Um, but just the, the chance to hear um, their questions and if there's a way that either they can do their own study or that I can uh, have folks come out and, and set up small areas to, to try some of these things on their place. Join us April 6th for the Gardner Angus Ranch 40th Anniversary Spring Production Sale at the ranch near Ashland, Kansas. The sale will feature 342 registered bulls, 386 registered females, and 532 bred Gardner Angus Influence commercial females. The sale will start at 9 a.m. sharp. If you are unable to join us in person, you can bid online by going to liveauction.tv and register prior to the sale. At Gardner Angus Ranch, you aren't just buying a breed, you are buying a brand backed by four generations of disciplined seed stock production. We hope to see you April 6th at the ranch. 
Lance Drew, veterinarian in Western Iowa. I have a veterinary clinic and uh, started doing stem cell therapy on dogs in August of 2014. And after the first two dogs, after three weeks, I saw such dramatic results. I said, hey, I have arthritis. I have joints really need this help. Where can I go to get this done? I had stem cell therapy done in November of 2014 on my finger joints, my hip, and the ball of my left foot, uh, all of which I'd had real severe problems with. Saw a pretty dramatic uh, improvement in a short amount of time. I would certainly recommend that somebody don't wait until I'm in the position that I was in with the d damage already done to my joints. I encourage veterinarians to use it for their animals, and I encourage anybody who sees this video, if you have need, get in contact with these people because this is a phenomenal place to have this done. The new Better Horses Network is worldwide. Presented by Lucas Oil. Featuring worldwide radio and TV with iconic hosts like Al Dunning, Sharon Camarillo, Ernie Rodina, Lindy Birch, and Craig Cameron. With American Cowboy, Horse and Rider, Brushy Creek, Cavenders, and Ride TV. Worldwide radio and TV. The all new Better Horses Network. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. All over the country, more and more communities are making the change to biodiesel, made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues, improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans while adding billions to our national economy. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. So this is where, again, we kind of get into this whole feed conversion efficiency idea. And this is, again, one of those things that if you read some of the popular press articles about beef that are cast in more of a negative light, um, usually they focus in on this as one of those issues, right, that we're using a lot of natural resources. Uh, beef produces or uses more feed per pound of gain as compared to pigs and chickens. Therefore, the world would be better off if we just had these monogastric animals, right? So we'll kind of walk through this, and mainly the, this exercise is just to show you that feed conversion efficiency, which is better, right, in terms of which species, really depends on how you're expressing it, okay? And this is very true in all things that our sustainability is the metric you choose really changes how things are ranked, right? There's lots of ways to express things. So this is feed conversion efficiency expressed in three ways. So the first column there is just pounds of feed dry matter per pound of product, okay, per pound of, excuse me, live weight gain, okay. So we have our U.S. average grain finished beef, and this is from some of our life cycle assessment work. Um, so this is that same 22 number, but just expressed per live weight in this, in this instance, okay, compared to broiler chickens compared to pork. So again, most people stop at this first column, right, that's in black, and say, Wow, look at that difference in dry matter feed conversion efficiency, right? Um, and again, this is a life cycle number for beef, right? If that was your feedlot feed conversion efficiency, you'd have some problems, right? But this is a life cycle number. Um, but what's important is that's not taking into account what we just said before, right? The fact that most of what cattle are eating is not in competition with the human food supply. And really, this is where this whole feed conversion efficiency argument comes from, right? That we're taking resources taking food out of the mouths of babes, right, and feeding it to livestock, and that's a bad situation. So how much of that feed is actually human edible, right? So corn or soy, okay? And obviously most of us wouldn't want to eat a corn-soy mixture, but if we had to, we could, right? So it is human edible material. So when we express feed conversion efficiency in that way, that's what that second column is, right? Those differences across the three species largely go away, right? So roughly about the same amount of human edible feed going to uh, produce live weight gain for all three species. What's different, of course, is what we just talked about with this essential amino acids, right? Pigs and chickens, like us, they need to eat those essential amino acids every day, right? They cannot synthesize them within their rumen 
like cattle do, right, and essentially rely on microbial protein to meet their protein needs. So that's really important because pigs and chickens are going to be eating more high-quality protein, meaning soy, right, soy-based products, compared to cattle, which eat very little or no soy on average across the United States. So that's key for this third column. Okay, so this is kind of a little bit of a weird concept at first, but this is essentially expressing feed conversion efficiency in a way that's saying, what is the value of the protein in the product? Okay, so beef, pork, or chicken. And value, I don't just mean dollar value, I mean this protein equation, right? Essential amino acids and how bioavailable it is compared to the same thing in the feed. Okay, so in this case, a higher number is better. So what you can see in the parentheses, as I've kind of put there, right, a value above one means we're actually generating more high-quality protein than is being used within that system, right? So these cattle are creating high-quality protein that would not exist without them, even though we're feeding them in this human and edible feed or edible feed. So those differences from uh, beef compared to pork and chicken, um, kind of twofold, right? One is, again, this, this issue that we're not feeding high-quality protein to cattle necessarily. And that's why that number is lower uh, for pigs and chickens, right? Because they're feeding more high quality essential amino acids and therefore that, that ratio is lower. Uh, the other thing is obviously I work for beef, right? So I'm not gonna make pork and chicken look better in this scenario. It's a kind of a joke, right? But it is, it is true, right? That th there are distinct differences. So the whole takeaway of this is that feed conversion efficiency really depends on what you choose, right? What are you, what are you prioritizing in terms of the numerator and the denominator, right? And I would argue that third column is actually more useful from a sustainability perspective because it's getting at what we care about, which is how we're going to feed 10 billion people, nourish 10 billion people in the future responsibly. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if your cattle get out, you could be held liable for that? Call me, let's have a discussion. 316-945-6733. As fourth generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. This segment brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. Sharply increasing quality grades? It's not a new headline, but a Kansas packer says it is a good problem to have. The grade has improved a lot. I've been with National for 12 years, and, uh, you know, we went from grading probably 45 to almost 85% choice now. Uh, so it, it has improved, but... It doesn't change our focus. We still look for the high choice, uh, prime, quality, black eyed kind of cattle. The more of those they purchase, the more quality minded customers they can serve. National Beef has built its business model around that. We've always been a value added kind of company, and uh, those cattle have always worked well for us. The quality has improved so quickly, it's, it's hard to imagine. And I think we'll see the same kind of improvement the next four to five years uh, that we've seen the last five, but after that we'll be almost to 100% choice, which would be fabulous, but uh, then we'll probably focus on some of the yield grade and uh, soundness and quality kind of cattle that, that we still look for that can make the haul and convert well and, and do good for feed yards and, and for packers. The higher grades present opportunities to move choice customers up to prime and retailers to dedicate ad space to the higher quality meat. The ranchers and the feedlots have accomplished so much improving the choice. So I feel like Prime is our next big opportunity as an industry. Hopefully uh, we can balance it uh, with the supply and, and grow the demand for it as the supply grows. Uh, uh, we've went from you know, maybe 1% to averaging close to 5% Prime on a weekly basis. And at those levels, you know, you can start to have guys feature it and expect to get it. and hopefully build their business uh, to grow along with uh, the cow-calf and the feedlot guys that are producing for us. Other opportunities lie in the niche programs like Natural. Barker says business is steady and National Beef is working to maximize the amount of each natural carcass marketed into the program. I'm Bob Cervera. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. 
Learn more at agpromosource.com.